Blog Talk Radio. Blog Talk Radio. Welcome and happy Sunday. It is Sunday the 3rd of August and I am here today with my special co-host Roxanne Swainhart. Hi Roxanne, are you there? Oh yes I am. Hi and thank you so much for having me on the show today. Very exciting show you got set up. I I have a very, very exciting show. I have a very special guest. His name is Philip Goldberg. He is the author of the book American Veda. And I'd like to welcome you, Philip, to the show. Are you there? Is he there, Philip? I am. Oh, there he is. Okay. Can you hear me? I can yes, hear you I perfectly. Am. Let me just tell the audience a little I'm bit about a little you. With Skype. Oh, that's okay. Is it okay? If we need to, we can always add you back into the call if it starts to go a little crazy. But you're okay I'm now? I'm hearing some background noise. Uh, hold on a second. I think something is going on here. Uh, okay. I have inadvertently. Okay. We're fine then. Okay. Perfect. Okay. The, the technicalities of internet radio. But um, I'll just give you a little bio on you if you don't mind. Um, Philip Goldberg has been studying Indian spiritual traditions for more than 40 years as both a practitioner and as an author. He is the author of and co-author of 19 books, including Road Signs on the Spiritual Path, The Intuitive Edge, and his latest, American Veda, which is From Emerson and the Beatles to Yoga and Meditation, How Indian Spirituality Changed the West. The book was named one of the top 10 religion books of the year 2010 by both the Huffington Post and the American Library Association. Deepak Chopra said, America Veda is an illuminating, gracefully written, and remarkable, thorough account of India's spectacular impact on Western religion and spirituality. He is an ordained minister and spiritual counselor, and he blogs blogs regularly on the Huffington Post and the Elephant Journal. His websites are AmericanVeda.com and PhilipGoldberg.com, and that's Philip with one L. Yes. Yes. Yes, so welcome. Aaron, uh, um, thank you. Um, I'm hearing us about a second or two after I hear you live. Okay, do you have your, do you have the uh, blog talk site open on your computer? Is that running as well? Um, uh, didn't, I didn't think so, but it's possible. Okay. Do you want to just check it for one moment? Yeah, make sure that all the programs are open. Right. And then if your microphone is too close to your speakers, turn your speakers down a little bit, unless you're on, of course, a headset. Um, this is, yeah, I'm hearing this echo. Okay. Well, what I can do is I can just add you. I can I can call you by phone if that would work better for you, and then maybe there, you won't have to. Or I can just try to ignore it. Okay. Well, if it becomes <laughs> <laughs> if it becomes overwhelming, then or I can just try to add you back really quick for one second. I can just take you off the call and add you back, and then we can see if that'll fix it. Do you want to do that? Okay. Okay. Let me just. Remove you, and then I'm going to add you right back. So I'm adding him right back right now. Pardon the delay. Pardon delay, everyone. Just we yeah. need to be is able she, to. Is he on a headset, though? I don't think so, no. Okay. Because okay. then he'll, you know, 
There you are. Voice. Are you back? I am back. How is the how is the echo? I don't no hear one. it. Hey. Very, very good. I think it's okay now. Perfect. Skype can be a little bit uh unpredictable. Actually I do hear it, but it's lower. Okay. Okay. Well That's fine. I'll 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 be able to uh ignore it. You can work through it. <laughs> very good. Okay, well again, once again, welcome welcome to the show. I would just like you to, if you can, just tell us about your book. Tell us the the reason behind it, the motivation to write it and anything else you would like to share about it? Well, um, in a sense, uh, I've been working on it and thinking about it for more than 40 years. Uh, When I was uh, a young man uh, in the 60s, I uh, gravitated to the spiritual traditions uh, that came to us from India, mostly what we think of as Hinduism, with some Buddhism thrown in. And um, those teachings changed my life. And they changed the lives of many other people around me back in those days. And and that continued as my involvement deepened and I saw the power and profundity of these teachings. Um, I also saw that as time progressed into the 70s and 80s, um, more and more people were being impacted by these teachings. And at a certain point uh, in my own development, I started writing. And in the mid-80s, I I actually proposed a book on the subject, and I didn't find any interest from publishers in, in, in the U.S. And so I scrapped the idea and thought, well, maybe I'm ahead of my time and I'll do it later. And then... Over time, I I just started to realize that this was not just something that was affecting individuals, you know, who were doing yoga and meditating and going to ashrams and studying with gurus and so forth. It was having a larger impact on uh, on the culture and in sneaky and sometimes uh, subtle ways. And so in the course of 20 years or so, the, the subject became a bigger one, a more profound one. And at at that time, in around 2006, um, an editor at Random House had a similar idea, and we got together, as um, fate would have it, or karma, and um, the book uh, evolved out of that. Um, It was just my own personal passion uh, combined with my own observations as a writer um, uh, who who started to see the larger impact of of this phenomenon? Well, I I know that in my research, I know that your original uh, original name for the book wasn't going to be American Beta. I like the name very much, um, but <laughs> <laughs> I want because it's catchy, you it was, know. It's it very was catchy. actually no, it was actually my editor's idea right from the beginning. Right, and what to was call your it name? American Beta. And I had a, a, a several alternatives along the way, but none of them uh, were as good, and so we ended up keeping it. Um, and you never know about titles. Some people love it, and some people some people think uh, it should have been different because people, uh, some people don't know what it means. And I get, but I think it, it's kind of work. People, most people get what it means because of the subtitle. Maybe you want to say what the subtitle is. The influ- If I remember exactly correctly, it's the influence of. Uh, oh, I I do. So I can say it. <laughs> okay, you please say it. The the subtitle is from Emerson and the Beatles yes. to Yoga and Meditation: How Indian Spirituality Changed the World. Well, that's what got me that part of it, because you, you know, yeah. because I I do know that that's true. I I I used to live in New York as you did, and I remember there are several things that that pop into my mind. Alex Ginsberg used to sit at this one diner and eat, and I used to look in the window at him a lot <laughs> as he was sitting there <laughs> yeah. eating. Yeah. 
you miss you 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 said Alex's name was Allen Ginsberg. Sorry, Allen Ginsberg. Excuse Just to, me. So Thank readers, you. so listeners are not confused. And you must have been in the East Village. I was in the East Village, and when I he was very he was very grouchy. But if you did approach him, he would talk to you through sips of coffee. Well, I met him a few times. Bites of pie. I had I actually met Alan. I met Alan a few times later in his life, and um, maybe he just didn't want to be bothered by the public when you, and so he got grouchy. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't want to be bothered because you know Mickey Mantle also used to sit in diners in New York, and he you know he also didn't want to be bothered as well. But I, I do know his name is Allen Ginsberg. But you know I really discovered Allen Ginsberg through Baba Ramdas. And I know that you've interviewed ah. also Baba Ramdas. Yeah. And, and so maybe you can say something about that. Well, that was one of the highlights of my research. Um, I did not get to interview Ramdas in person because he lives in Hawaii, and I did not have the research budget to go <laughs> to Hawaii to, visit, to interview him. I interviewed him by phone. And it was, you know, I interviewed over 300 people for American Data, and um, some of them were uh, people who uh, your listeners are probably familiar with, like Deepak and, and Ram Dass and, and others. Um, and uh, but Ram, with Ram Dass, it had an extra special kind of warmth because, you know, he already had his stroke and. Um, has, he's like this revered elder to us now, yes. and, and um, it, was, it was really a special kind of uh, feeling to interview him. Well, his book that I have, the Be Here Now book, has basically been mm -hmm. mutilated by me because it's been so read and turned and twisted and, and everything. So he was, I, I actually wrote him a letter after he had his stroke, and he very kindly wrote back. So that was very, very special. But talk mm -hmm. about, um, talk about you, 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 look at, you look at the history of American spiritualism, really starting at the time just before Emerson got hold of some of the Eastern works. But it really started with Emerson, which you make very clearly in your book. And, and part of, you know, I, I think you almost have another book just on Emerson with all of your research. Um, you know, did I? There's um, <laughs> almost any chapter in the book. In fact, some of the sub-chapters in the book could have been books in themselves. Yes. And in fact, they have been. You know, they have been. I mean, I have three or four pages of profiling certain people about whom biographies have been written. So, you know, um, that's the one of the challenges when you when you do a book of this kind of scope. You know, you 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 have to cover a lot of ground, and there's a lot of towering personalities involved yeah. and I want you know to do justice to all of them uh, is impossible uh, if you need to keep the book at a manageable length so there's a good deal of material on Emerson but you're right I mean you know 500 page biographies have been written about about Emerson yeah. and one of my sources for the book was a book just about the Indian influence on Emerson, and that you know is a whole book by a scholar named Robert Gordon, uh, in and of itself. So you know, my I have to be um, painstaking in getting to the essence of, of each point and um, and keeping it concise, but. To get back to the, your uh, original point, yes, the the um, the beginning of the phenomenon of um, India's a spiritual heritage influencing America begins in earnest with Emerson, but it it begins with Emerson because his own father was one of the people who were influenced by the early uh, some of the earliest. English translations of the Bhagavad Gita and other texts and books about India and some of the writings of contemporary Indian thinkers in the late 18th century that were starting to come uh, into uh, America through 
Europe, so mostly uh, the UK, in English. Right. And, you know, because the British ruled India at that time, and some some of the British scholars, I mean, it's a, a long and sordid history, but, you know, the, the people who were first had, uh, the Western Europeans who first had contact with India, you know, they had a colonial agenda and a... Um, a missionary agenda. Yeah, that's so the point their, I wanted you to make, yes. Yes. Their interpretation of Hinduism and Buddhism was not very flattering and not very accurate. They were writing about, the, you know, the, the British had scholars uh, investigating the religions of India to help the missionaries convert people and do their work, and so that the colonial rulers would... Uh, find it easier to uh, understand the people they were ruling. Um, but then some of those scholars were objective enough and insightful enough to recognize the, the profound uh, intelligence and wisdom in the uh, ancient teachings of India. And so the, some of the uh, commentary started to be a little more accurate and more um, respectful. And those started to reach America uh, at the end of the uh, 18th century. And when Emerson was a young boy in the early part of the 19th century, um, he grew up around it because his father started something called the Asiatic uh, Society or, and the Asiatic Journal. And his father was a minister who um, was drawn to the Eastern teachings. And so he had some of these books in his library growing up. And by the time he was a student at Harvard, had imbibed a lot of it and uh, had an aunt who was deeply into it, who would provide him with books and stuff. And um, so it started to have a, a, a big impact on his own thinking and his own way of understanding the universe and God and who we are and what we're here for and so forth. And eventually was a major factor in Emerson's um, giving up his own ministry to become essentially what I think of as our, our founding father of spiritual but not religious and um, yeah. sort of um, uh, turned away from the organized religion of his time and became a kind of freelance philosopher who became extremely well-known and really launched a different way of being spiritual and, and a different kind of philosophy onto American life. And, and that mushroomed from there with his influence, influencing other people and then access to the uh, direct access to the, the books and teachings of India uh, growing over time. Well, what I think there's a beautiful explanation. I think what I would perhaps like to ask you to do is maybe sort of give the listening audience some ideas in in short shorthand what what did india specifically give us they gave us the term spiritual not religious um what well, are some of the other ideas that came out. through yeah i mean spiritual but not religious is a is a sort of modern term i know that people saying. started self identifying with themselves meaning that um, there's a way to be spiritual um, and retain some independence of choice and independence of judgment. And when people say spiritual but not religious, they mean different things, but for the most part it means they're serious about their spiritual life. But, and, and their spiritual life is primarily identified as an inner search for, well, for, the, for the, what your show is called, for oneness for the uh, divine intimacy and connection and union with the divine nature of existence and, or what some people would call God. And, but, to, but doing so outside the confines of customary religion, uh, meaning they don't necessarily have to accept uh, the dogmas and um, uh, doctrines and belief systems of those religions or participate in them and, and uh, feel free to um, cultivate their own spiritual life in a way that suits them 
drawing from whatever influences um, make sense to them and and have a positive impact on their spirituality. And that um, has grown and grown in in Western Europe and the U.S. over time to the point where it's it's now uh, recognized uh, and um, a phenomenon with you know large numbers of people identifying that way. But I mentioned that in the context of Emerson because he kind of declared his independence from formal churches and uh, implored people to forge their own direct connection with the divine without the necessity of the intermediary of priests and churches and and so forth, and and recognize that our own inner nature, our own essential nature, who we ultimately are when we quiet the mind and go beyond our individual personalities and all the the stuff and the the concepts and the uh, ideas that we impose upon ourselves about who we are, that ultimately our own nature is divine. And it is the same divine nature as that which we call God or that which we call the universe. And this is a great contribution, uh, one of the great contributions of the um, traditions that were uh, birthed in India thousands of years ago in the Himalayas with the, the great insights of the rishis in their um, higher consciousness were able to discern this unity of what we really are. Um, they, called the, they called the ultimate nature of reality, the Sanskrit term is usually Brahman, and the nature of the individual self, the ultimate nature of the individual self beyond ego and personality and body identity is called Atman. And one of the great sayings of the Hindu tradition is that Atman is Brahman. And so there is a recognition of our own divine nature and a recognition that that realization of that um, unity is within reach of everybody because it's who we are. And the methodologies of yoga, primarily meditation and all the uh, purification techniques and so forth, are meant to uh, sort of remove the veils that obscure the light of wisdom that is our own um, birthright and our own inheritance. And that's those, if I can boil it down to those two things, that is essentially the essence of what came to us from India, that God or the divine is not something outside of us, someplace else in the cosmos, in some location. It is omnipresent everywhere. There is nothing that is not divine and sacred and holy, and that includes us in our own inner nature, and that there's great value in our awakening to uh, that that reality of what we are and that the path of awakening to that is generally a gradual one, but that there's rewards along the way. And that's why so many people have taken to practices that derive from these traditions the, the, what we think of now as yoga and meditation practices as essential parts of their uh, spiritual path or if they're secular, uh, of their own secular self-improvement because there's great inner peace and clarity of mind and so forth. There's practical benefits that accrue along the way. Right. You know, I, I, I'm a channel, I had told you earlier, and one of the things that uh, one of the first channelings I ever received was my guides said to me, and, and they're called Theos, which uh, remarkably means uh, word of God. And mm-hmm. what they said to me is that it's very important always to know who you are and who you are not. Mm-hmm. And 
just the the whole spiritual journey is about discovering who you really are and who you really are not. And and that's what we see yes, in this conscious awakening. Yeah. Right, and and that's what you just described is um, one of the paths of yoga is Gyan Yoga, which is a, 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 a yoga of discernment and, and and so forth. And the essence of that is to to be discerning about what we are and what we are not. And yes. you know, one of the the, the uh, expressions of that is this practice of what's called neti neti, where you contemplate who you are and what, what, what the nature of your life is, and, and you realize, well, I am not a person called Phil who occupies this body. I am not just that. I, it is ultimate reality is not this, not this, not this, not this, which is what neti neti means. Right. And ultimately, in, in the negation of what seems to be who you are, you ultimately realize there is no words, there's no language for what we are. It is just what is. And what is, is what we are. There's a wonderful meditation uh, that, that I found. It's called That Which Remains. And the, and the, the essence of the yes. meditation, it says, are you your hands? And your answer is, no, I am not. If you are, if you are not your hands, then who are you? And it's I am that which remains. And basically you go through every body part and every organ ah. and you let it all go. And then it says when the nothing's left, who are you? And the answer always is I am that which remains. So it's, That's right. And and so the Buddhists call that uh, often what's described as emptiness. Uh-huh. Um, and but the emptiness is fullness, and so there, one of the one of the things in one of the Hindu sayings is translated as fullness is emptiness, and emptiness is fullness. Right. That's beautiful. Um, I think what would be interesting for everyone to understand, just again, for because I think a lot of the terminology when they're Hindu words can be new for people. Um, the the primary knowledge has come down to us through uh, the Vedas. And can you define what the Vedas are and what teachings they encompass? Also, can you also give a definition of what is a Rishi for everyone? Oh, a Rishi is... Is a, is a word, you know, you could just think of it as a great sage. Yeah, a holy man or a great a sage. Seer, right. seer, a sage, a holy holy person, yes. Um, um, so I don't want to get bogged down into the Sanskrit because I'm not a Sanskrit scholar, but that's essentially what it means. And um, um, the Veda, Veda means knowledge. Right. And um, the Vedas are what uh, usually um, are what we think of as the Vedas are the four great, um, what began as oral traditions thousands of years ago um, and then were codified in four books of the Vedas. And and so those are considered the, the four Vedas. Um, and these are ancient texts that, that, as I said, pre-existed as oral traditions that got passed on from uh, Rishi to, to disciple, guru to disciple over many, many, many millennia. Um, and these are very uh, esoteric texts, uh, often very hard to uh, translate and discern. But the Vedic period is... is you know, felt to be the the sort of origin of all the great uh, spiritual teachings that eventually some of which separated out into what we now think of as different religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism. Um, Over time, things evolve and there's revival and things degenerate and there are revivals and then there's variations and and so forth, and so the the the, the whole vast tradition of uh, what we think of now as Hinduism is really very diverse, and the Dharmic traditions in general, what we think of as the, the traditions that stem from the Vedic period, are even more diverse. But um, 
the essence of what came to the West is really not what you find in the um, four Vedas, uh, the Samhitas, the books of the Vedas, right. but what came later in the philosophical system we think of as Vedanta. And Vedanta means literally the end of the Vedas. Right. And that, that, has two peer, two, that has two meanings. One is the end of the Vedas, meaning the, the end of the Vedic period, as we came to date that, um, and the, uh, chronologically. And the other is the culmination. This is the end. This is the, the culmination of the development of ideas and insights that came from the Vedic period. And those, uh, uh, the, the primary sources of Vedanta are the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads, and also some people say the Brahma Sutras. But um, the, the, the teachings that are embodied in the collected works called the Upanishads, the principal Upanishads, mm -hmm. and the uh, that are distilled in this incredible gem-like essence in the Bhagavad Gita. That is the essence of Vedanta, and um, there, you know, is the expression of what I had described earlier: that um, the ult ultimate reality is both um, transcendent that is beyond anything we can imagine, beyond this, the world and the senses and beyond uh, duality and du beyond form and expression, and also imminent. That is, it is everywhere. It is in my computer. It's in the book. It's in the desk. It's in the cup of tea. The divine is everywhere and everything. Right. One and the many, and that... And that God, if we want to use that term, can be conceived as without form, just completely transcendent and beyond imagining, and uh, also imminent. That is, God is everywhere. God is this, God is that, God is me. And so it's absolute and beyond form, but also within every form. It is the uh, and that it, that is how the the Vedanta understands the nature of ultimate reality, and and that it has been given numerous names uh -huh. and numerous descriptions and described in numerous ways because it is infinite. So human beings will express it in various ways at different points in history and different places on the earth um, and different cultures and we'll imagine it in many many different forms hence you have all the, the you know in Islam for example of 99 names of God 99 expressions of God and in, in Hinduism you have all these multifarious uh, images of God and different uh, expressions and personalities and so forth and but ultimately it is understood that there is one reality but that takes many forms and that this is accessible to us this, this ground of being is who we are it is the nature of the self with a capital s and in realizing that essential nature of ourselves we find freedom and we find many practical benefits along the way. Um, should I go? Sorry. Oh, sorry. No, no, you sorry. I you. muted myself, but no, it's beautiful what you're saying. I, I have a, a quote, well, actually, uh, just a small, small prose that was written by Emerson. It was called The Informing Spirit. Right. And it says, There mm. is no great and no small to the soul that maketh all, soul with a capital S. And where it cometh, all things are, and it cometh everywhere. I am the owner of the sphere, of the seven stars of the solar year, of Caesar's hand and Plato's brain, of Lord Christ's heart and Shakespeare's strain. That's the... Wow. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. This yeah, is, well, I didn't write it. <laughs> but, well, that's, that's a good choice. 
yeah, you chose you. well. Um, yeah, I, and I I have several uh, quotes of Emerson and chapter from Emerson on in the, on the chapter about him, and um, you know you can see the influence of well several influences. Right. One that is direct reading of some of these ancient texts directly from India in their English translation. And also, he was influenced by some of the British and German um, romantic philosophers who in turn had been influenced by India. So there's a kind of East-West thing being birthed at that time, and Emerson uh, gave voice to it. And plus his own insights. It seems pretty obvious that Emerson was one of those um, spiritually gifted people who was seeing the ultimate reality um, and and intuiting it and having glimpses of it and these books gave um, gave expression to it. it it helped him understand what he was experiencing within himself as he wandered through the woods of, of New England and and at, at that time well he he really laid the foundation he his most important works would, wow, if you would say, would be uh, the Transcendentalist. Um, he, within some several other essays, he wrote on spiritual laws, and then also Nature was the the book. Yeah, Nature was a, a big one that um, sort of launched his career, actually. Was right. And he he talked about that everything that that you can know everything if if you just will go into nature and yeah. The simplest, he, he, and I, I had written it down, and I, I can't find the quote that I wanted to say, but what he said so beautifully was something to the effect of, you know, if you if you want to know truth, go into nature and have your own experience with the divine, right. and don't take what that's, anyone tells you as truth, but have your own experience. That's right. That got him into trouble, that kind of idea. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, he was an ordained minister, and he gave it up. He, he, he as he put it, he defrocked himself. Uh-huh. And and in I think it was 1839, he gave a very famous. And your your listeners may want to um, Google this. It, he, he Emerson's famous um, address to the Harvard Divinity School. In um, in fact, I wrote an essay about that on Huffington Post a couple of years ago on the anniversary of it. Um, and if you read that, it's, it, some people called it our spiritual declaration of independence. And he was telling these divinity school gra- graduates, people who are about to become uh, ministers, uh, essentially, give your people a direct experience of God. They don't need all this churchy stuff. <laughs> and um, it was pretty outrageous. And, you know, he became uh, sort of um, a persona non grata at Harvard, which was his alma mater, until he became so famous that he gave him an honorary doctorate. Well, that always that always helps when, when fame yeah. overrides everything. Yeah. yeah. So so from him, Emerson, then you had Henry David Thoreau they, that was yeah. impacted and also just – would you tell the story of Gandhi and how Gandhi really oh. was influenced? Well, yeah, it's it's a, it's a nice little um, um, anecdote in the context of American Veda and the influence from India, how India has influenced America and America in turn influenced India. And, you know, you see it. I just did a month-long speaking tour of India uh, last fall when my book came out there. And, you know, you see the the Western influence everywhere. It's visible. Yes. You know, in technology and the automobiles and the computers and everything. But the reverse, the influence of India on the West, is a lot more subtle and invisible and because it's in the realm of ideas and, you know, a private insights and practices on, on individuals' life, but it's having a visible now manifestation as a sort of uh, spiritual revolution that's been sparked by the access to teachings from the East. But that that sort of influence had been going on for quite some time. So Thoreau, because Emerson was a kind of mentor and friend to Thoreau, 
Uh, when Thoreau spent that uh, period of time on Walden Pond that became the book Walden and became so famous, made him so famous, um, he was reading the copy of the Bhagavad Gita that he borrowed from Emerson. Wow. And he would read it every morning. And he wrote about that in Walden and spoke of, you know, how incredible uh, the Gita was and how um, uh, far advanced it was, even though it's ancient and so forth. And um, when I was interviewing people for American Veda, a lot of people said their first exposure to Indian uh, philosophy was when they read Walden as a student and saw that, uh, you know, Thoreau loved these teachings and the Bhagavad Gita, so they would go out and buy a copy. Um, So anyway, uh, Thoreau um, was influenced by the Bhagavad Gita, and his essay on civil disobedience in turn influenced Gandhi. Wow. And was um, influential in Gandhi's um, strategic use of nonviolence in in his independence campaign. And, of course, both of them loved the Bhagavad Gita as a sort of coincidental uh, add-on to this. You know, it was, it was Gandhi's, it was with Gandhi all the time, and it was his main source of inspiration, he, he would always say. Um, but then, in turn, Gandhi, of course, influenced Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement. Yeah. So you had this influence of India on Thoreau and then Thoreau on Gandhi and then Gandhi on the American Civil Rights Movement and Martin Luther King and that that sort of interaction continues to this day. It, I, I wrote down the question when I was thinking about things that I, when, as I was reading your books, I, I took, I, I think I told you like 50 pages of notes because I was really fascinated. It, it got very exciting. You know, I really thought I was in a, 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 I was writing a dissertation or something, but it was really good. But I, I wrote down the question as like, did you feel like you were on the hot trail of knowledge? I mean, once you started really seeing all the through lines of everything, did you just, I mean, it was exciting for me. I, as a musician, and and I when I lived in New York and I studied jazz and everything, they always said you have to know your roots in order to have the authenticity yes. of the music. And it's this, and I I think it's sort of the same thing. Of you know we look mm. at all the different you you have the spiritualist church, the Unity Church, the many organizations right. that you listed that have really been have really sprung out of these teachings. And, you know, we've had a lot of things and there's a whole spiritual revolution going on in the world at the moment. And I really want to say it does ultimately lead back to these things and these ideas because these ideas are now becoming worldwide. It's not just some guy in a corner having an opinion. It's it's becoming okay. the, the mass consciousness of the planet. And That's in the right. West, it's it's in the West, it's quite recent. We can you know we can track it back just 150 years. But if you look at the essence of the teachings, they go back thousands of years. And I think it's amazing how they've infiltrated and continue to infiltrate and awaken so many people in such a lovely way. But but so when you started doing this, I guess go back to my real question. You know what was the you said you've been writing the book for 40 years, but is it well, I mean, not sense, physically writing it in, in your I mind? Was. Yeah. In your mind, you've yeah. been interested in this subject. But when you started to really yeah. sort of lay out the timeline, what was your what was your first reaction to that? Well, here's the thing. When I, when I signed the contract to write the book, I thought I'll, this will be easy because I'd been gathering material and living this for so many years. But once I started actually doing the research formally, as you said, it was this incredible series of discoveries, mini discoveries, and then each one taking me 
on another trail and another tributary because especially these days when um you know you can do so much research over the internet right. you know i i read something and then there'd be a link to something else and then there'd be a link to something else and then i'll <laughs> say oh my god i didn't know there had been a an ashram in arizona at that you know and or you know look at that there's a a, a spirit a guru who lives in in Tennessee and you know whatever it was it would be one, I thought I knew a lot and then but as many people have said the more you know the more you realize you don't know and it it just mushroomed and it was such um so thrilling and such a delight to make these discoveries that the book ended up taking two years longer than I planned. And um, at one point, I I had to say, okay, Phil, stop interviewing people and start writing because, you know, you're, you, I was having these great conversations and meeting all these wonderful people and learning all these new things and reading a new book and finding a new website and, you know, whatever it was. And at a certain point, you realize you can just research this for the rest of your life yeah. But you got to write the book, yeah. and and it was that way. And at, even with the restrictions of time and uh, page numbers, it was a tremendous effort to keep it to the 350 pages plus notes that it is. Because you know it could have easily been a, a 600 or an 800 page book if if I wanted it to be. But I then think no it could be a doctoral to. course. I really think it could be a life oh, study. Yeah. Easily. Yeah. Easily. I mean, as I said, you know, there there are subjects that take up two, three pages that people have written whole books about. So I could it could have been a lot bigger. And, and I've actually gotten some emails saying, oh, you didn't say enough about this or you didn't include that. And I'm thinking, well, I did originally, but it was cut in the <laughs> final draft. <laughs> you got to get it down to size. You have to you know? see what's on the cutting room floor. There's a whole other book. Yeah, right. And um, boy, there's just so much. You know, and now we're trying to make a film version of it, which will, of course, leave out a lot that's in the book. So, oh, you know, that's wonderful. Iteration. Congratulations on that. That's wonderful. Well, well if, you'll congratulate me when we raise the money for the budget. Well, I, I I believe in the book and I believe in its message. And I, I, I just want to say this. I said this to you, but I want to say this also to the audience. When I first saw uh, Philip on YouTube, and that's actually how I came, and I don't even know why I found your video. I have no idea. But it was a talk. I think I was looking for something. I was looking for, I don't who knows, but I found you. And I, I listened to a lecture that you gave, and you were, I think it was 45 minutes, and you were saying, I'm sorry I took up so much time. And I was thinking, oh, you you know, you need to keep going because this isn't over. And so I immediately looked you up, and I saw you, and I wrote you a letter. But when I when I saw the initial talk that you gave, I thought, oh, this is a nice book. This will be really interesting. And then, of course, I ordered the book, and I started reading it, and I had no idea of how important this book is. It's really, it's, it's, it's a great work. It's a great com, uh, culmination. It's a great compiling. And it's really a walk through the path of our history, um, as well as being insightful in its own way. Because it does teach you, in, in many ways, Hinduism. It teaches you Eastern thought. It gives you the principles and it also gives you the support information around it that does tell you what to go to next and, and, and what to look up and who to listen to. I think as a as a piece of literature it is very, very important and I you know, I'm I'm not in the a literati or the, the literati or any of that, but I would say that for many, many years to come and possibly for hundreds of years to come, this will be a go-to book for many, many people. And, I really appreciate that, Tom. Well, I mean it with all sincerity. I, I'm not uh, – I, I really do. And as I was reading it, I, I was just blown away by the scope of information, and I thought, wow – you know, if you ever want to know where you come from, here it is. 
So I get that a lot from people, and it's very gratifying, especially people who lived through uh, the era of the 60s and 70s when they were younger um, and were influenced by uh, you know, one or more of the gurus who came here or um, the books that are cited and the philosophers or the musicians, the Beatles, speaking of music. Yeah, I want um, you to talk and, to them as um, well. Yeah. I, yes, of course we will, yeah. Mm-hmm. But um, I always get uh, gratification when people say, oh, you know, you, uh, you taught me so much about my own journey and, you know, what we've all, so many of us have experienced in our own spiritual past. But I, I also thank you for recognizing that it's not just the history, but it's also, um, I, I really, I try to explore the, uh, the implications of all this and at the same time give people some basic understanding of what uh, the Hindu Dharma is and what the, the essence of Vedanta and the yogic path is. Um, so that they can you know, better understand their own spiritual lives and, and, and the impact that all of this has had on our culture. And if I may, this is, can I... Uh, I was going to say, yes, it's a that? perfect time. Go for it. Yes, definitely. It's a perfect time. I'm, I'm going to be uh, teaching an online course called The Great Yogic Transmission and um, through um, holistica.com, that's W H O L I S T I K A dot com, and it's going to be uh, three sessions, five or more hours, um, and people can take it uh, at, at any time, starting uh, in on September 14th, um, and just go to the site and sign up and um, watch the sessions uh, at their convenience. And I'm going to go into not just the history but really explore the essence of these teachings and what they give us regardless of our own spiritual orientation and how we can uh, use them to uh, advance our own spiritual lives and integrate them into our life in the world with all of the uh, challenges and um, duties and responsibilities of what we call real life. (laughs) (laughs) And so I like that. I wonder if I Did you do finger quotes when you said real <laughs> life or not? Well, yeah, quotes around real life. <laughs> yeah. um, and um, um, But I want to invite uh, your listeners to uh, look into that on holistica.com. And what I will do is I'll go back into this. Uh, when, I, when I post this on YouTube and promote it, I'll, I'll add that holistica um, website as well. And then there will be a link on my website. Thank you about oneness.com to where you can also get to this course because I'm going to take it. So I'm, I'm excited to. Oh, great. Yeah. And then, and we'll dig into um, what, uh, uh, what oneness is about. Well, that's, that's, that's all. Well, that's what I'm about. So I'm, I'm excited to, to. <laughs> your that's, that's essentially the course is about oneness. They, well, you know, it's interesting because when I was trying to think of the name of the program, I was thinking Dancing yeah. with the Divine, and I wanted to just sort of do a tribute to Baba Ramdas and his his works and, yeah. and uh, Be Here Now, and I was discussing it with my mother, and she said, well, what is it that you want to communicate? And I said, well, I want to talk about the connectivity of everyone, and I want to talk about the oneness. And she said, oh, I like that, about oneness. And then she first we go. said about the oneness, and I said, no, that's it. It's it's because that's really that's all it's about is the oneness, right? Or oneness, yeah. Well, that's there. It is. You are uh, you. Uh, Vedanta is captured in the title of your uh, radio show. Well, I I do it all as a tribute to Ganesha, and if if it's in service to that, then I can ask for nothing more. So. That's great. Yeah, thank you. So just we have about we're going to take a break in about six minutes, but possibly you can talk about your own faith and what was your what was your uh, faith before you came into contact with with Eastern thought <laughs> and and <laughs> how did that transform to where you are now? Uh, my my faith <laughs> was no faith. Okay, um, I was 
Well, that's true. I was raised by um, very secular people of Jewish descent in New York City, right. um, you know, sort of post-World War II secular um uh, secular political people who thought religion was ridiculous and, you know, they had no uh, interest in it. (laughs) No, well, but but they they also thought, you know, they were sort of quasi-Marxist, and so (laughs) religion to them was the the opium of the people. And, um, and, you know, it was understandable looking back there, their idea of what religion was, was what they saw around them, and they saw hypocrisy and they saw people believing in things that uh, were contradicted by the evidence of history and uh, science, and it all seemed foolish and um, um, anti-progress to them. And so I had no religious upbringing. In fact, I like to say my my upbringing was not only non-religious, it was (laughs) anti-religious. And that's how I was. You know, right up into college, I was uh, politically active in the 60s and the, you know, civil rights movement and the anti-war movement and so forth. But there was something deeply missing in my own life. And, you know, we're all, whether we lived it or we (laughs) we heard about it from our parents or read, you know, or in history class now because it's been so long, the, the 1960s counterculture and the whole hippie thing was it was a rejection not only of um, war and conformity and uh, superficial materialistic values, but it was a repudiation of religion in the conventional sense. And many people just uh, became totally secular and hedonistic, but many of us, uh, were launched onto a spiritual search. We knew there was something more. There was something more to life and that there, were, there must be ways of finding fulfillment and happiness and meaning and purpose. There must be some connection between me and the rest of the cosmos um, that we're not being taught. Um, and then the teachings of the East just became so accessible to us in easy ways uh, through a variety of sources, um, you know, especially in the in the late '60s, the, you know, gurus were coming to the West from India and, and Buddhist masters. Uh, it was easier to find the the uh, literature of Hinduism and Buddhism and Taoism. Uh, the, the books were floating around, and um, uh, and then many uh, Westerners who were maybe our elders, like Ram Dass, and like, well, he came a little later, but, but also people like Aldous Huxley and Alan Watts and Joseph Campbell and uh, many others had been impacted by Eastern teachings, and they conveyed them to us. And, we, and then, of course, it came through music. And I know you want to get back to that, but when Ravi Shankar met George Harrison and became a super, superstar, and the Beatles took up Transcendental Meditation and went to India, the floodgates opened, and everybody said, oh, there's these, this, this material, this, this body of wisdom that comes from India. This isn't religion in the typical sense of dogma and antiquated ideas. This is a living realities that you can investigate on your own and, and with practices and techniques that you can add to your life that, that you could test out on your own. And uh, people who seem to embody a higher level of consciousness, and we all took to it uh, yeah. in, in large numbers. Well, it was a that great was answer neat. to yeah. Well, it's a, well, it's a great answer to so many people asking their yearning. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I had said to you earlier that when I first read the Bhagavad Gita, I cried because I finally found all the things that I'd been hearing in my head, in my conversation with God that's gone on my whole life, it was right there, condensed mm-hmm. into this tiny little book of however many tiny little pages. And it was the conversation that I had had over a period of years. 
you know, they were right there in the same simple, plain words. And yeah. I thought, I have been hearing God. I have been. It was such a confirmation. Not that I doubted it before, but it was such a beautiful confirmation of what I knew. And Emerson has a quote, and I can't find it, but he says something to the effect of, you know, if you just let children evolve into having their own questions and honoring their questions and letting them look into their own souls, they will always know Mm. the truth. And that's and, so, hmm. But then, you know, we we have glimpses of of, course. of more, but, you know, if you're, obviously if you're a child, but even if you're an adult and you, you don't have the words, you don't have the concepts, you don't have the explanation, you just have a sense of something right. uh, to one degree. And, and then you find something like the Gita, Right. or the Upanishads, and that's what they're there for. The books by themselves are nothing. But if if they lead you to the experience, or you have the experience, and then the books can give you the understanding and the framework so you know what it is you've intuited and have language for it, and uh, you, then you can own it and and make it practical in your life. And, you, and you're not just fishing around saying, am I crazy? Am I just you know, imagining stuff, what does this mean? And you realize, no, there's a a tradition thousands of years old and many people who have articulated these ideas and these these insights into language that is uh, accessible and that invites you into it, but not as something you must believe in, but as something you're invited to experience on your own. And test and discern and throw it away if you want to. It's, it's an That's invitation right. to explore and know. And if you want it, great. If you don't, it's also great. Right. And, and that's there's no dogma, like you said, attached, and there's no musts, there's no shoulds. It's, it's just knowing yourself and finding yourself without any attachment to any of it. And, it's, and, and a recognition that your path will be different from the next person's path and the next person's path. And there are certain universals, but that right. there's infinite diversity as well. And one of the reasons I, I point out in American Veda that the teachings of the East gained so much uh, traction in the West was nobody forced you to convert to anything, and nobody said, you know, you must believe this or you'll go to hell. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> they just said, here, try it out, test it out, and see if it works for you. Well, we use the term a lot. We say, uh, Roxy and I both say, all roads lead you home. But there's also one of the Vedantic principles, all paths are true. All paths are yeah. correct. Yeah. Ultimate. Ultimate. Ultimately, any, any, any legitimate pathway to the spirit, if taken deeply enough and sincerely enough, will, will bring you to the ultimate reality. And that's what is meant by uh, truth is one, the, the wise call it by many names. Right. Uh, this is a good place to take a break, I think. Do you want to take five to six minutes or ten minutes, however much, how long you need, and then we'll go through the okay. announcements and come back when you're ready. Okay. I'm, okay. I'll be here. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll see you in just a few minutes. Okay. Thank you. Roxy, are you there? Well, of course, darling. I'm right here. You have been so quiet. Well, I just wanted to listen because uh, that was my highest joy just to follow this track that he was putting out. And it Isn't was it just, wonderful? It was it? really, really, really very exciting. Aren't you excited? A lot, to lot of insight now? Aren't you excited? Yeah, to read the book? yeah. Well, I've got three lined up, so I will put it in line. <laughs> I know how it goes. <laughs> I know but I go through goes. books pretty quick. I, I, I do, unless it's unless it's okay. like. Well, speaking of the uh, India background, uh-huh. uh, Total Freedom by Krishnamurti, I read that book two times in one year. It took me one year to get through it twice. I, I want so to bring that up Some books take a little time. Yeah, to, yeah, I we'll dance with that. I, I want to bring that up. You can maybe talk about your love of that. But um, yeah. also the right. idea of him being an Ojai, which is very interesting. because Yeah, that was funny. Yeah, that was some of his travels, too. And then I read another book that... Uh, Oh I, oh, I can't remember her name. It'll come to me. I'll, I'll tie that in later. 
But, uh, yeah, let's do the announcements, and then we'll get back. And, uh, do you have the announcements? Can you start with them? Yep, I got them right mind? here. Okay. I, I think I got them. I'm not sure I have everything lined up, but let me see. I know that, uh, yeah, okay. So we'll, we'll go ahead and start. And this is the Enlightenment Evolution Network, and it was started by the one, the only, the king, Rob Gauthier. And we all hail the king, Rob Gauthier. And he started this, and it's just profoundly, as we all know, expanded into this wonderful uh, network with one show, um, and then two, and then three, and then I was the fourth, and then all of a sudden, boom, 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 we got three more, and uh, then another one. Well, actually, we got one more, five, and then three in a row right after that, which was Kalina's, yours, and uh, Viva's. Right, um, all the women came in. Victoria, yeah, all the <laughs> All the female ballads came in, <laughs> which was awesome. So um, here's here's how it goes. It starts out on Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern time, and that will be Daniel Scranton hosting Heart to Heart Radio Talk, uh, Talk Radio, pardon me again, with Daniel Scranton, just like it sounds. Go to danielscranton.com. Daniel is in the Bible, Scranton is in Pennsylvania. And you can join him and any of his featured guests, and they discuss everything and anything about the ship, DTs, global events, channeling, uh, energy work, anything like that. Tony, he, he channels Ophelia the Fairy. He channels the Creators. He channels Hathors. A lot of great information coming to him at all times. And also now the Unicorn Collective has been added to his, let's say, repertoire, so to speak. So, um, yeah, tune into that show on Monday, and you're going to get a great, great aspect from, you know, his perspective of the Ascension. And there's always an excellent reflection each and every show. So if you're available on Monday, it's your highest excitement. Tune in to the Enlightenment Evolution Network and to Daniel's show called, once again, Hot Talk Radio with Dean Scream. So now, that's uh, the one. And now Tuesday, our afternoon show, we have two shows on Tuesday. We have an afternoon and an evening show. Uh, the afternoon is Soulfulpreneur with, um, it's, uh, it's called Soulfulpreneur Radio, which is inspiration, expression, and abundance. And if you are thinking, feeling, having the highest excitement to start a spiritual-based business, this is the radio program to tune into and to call in because they are definitely a uh, business specialist when it comes to the idea of starting a spiritual based business, whether it's psyche, tarot, medium, kibbles, bits, it does not matter. Tune into Rachel Arculitis and Megan Crandomile, and then they themselves are great readers, mediums, and they have huge, huge perspectives. So tune in for that if you're down that path, but tune in for that for anything, really, because it's all perspective of the ascension. And then Tuesday evenings is our new show that started along with yours the same week as yours. Is yeah. uh, Was it the 18th? Well, she started on the 22nd. So. Oh, yeah, which is the Tuesday after. Right. And that's, uh, oh, you know what, where is it? Did they move it? It's not on here. Hang on. There it is. I'm sorry, guys. Sorry about that. Victoria Viva <laughs> hosting Earth Sky People Radio, awakening to an intergalactic society, bringing to the greater awareness regarding star seeds and extraterrestrial life, living in harmony with one another, with Mother Earth and life beyond Earth, the interstellar alliance and planet uh, Earth becoming part of the intergalactic society, which is just, that thought in and of itself is so awesome to be part of the Council of Nine, Council of Twelve, any kind of intergalactic, leads me right back to the much-awakened Gene Roddenberry, already putting in the prime prime, prime directive way back in the 60s, the Galactic Federation, the whole idea, and she's bringing it, tuning it in, bringing it to you right now in reality and not do the idea of a sci-fi TV show. So awesome work there, Victoria, and she is excellent with music, excellent with toning, anything like that. Tune in, and she always has great guests, and she's an excellent, turns out to be, interviewer, because when she took it to Treb last week, that was freaking awesome. It was. It was a beautiful <laughs> that was, interview. She that was really a good interview. All the questions you've ever wanted to know but weren't able to ask. She did a right. very good job, yes. Yeah. And her show is on Tuesday evenings at 9 on the East and uh, 6 on the West Coast. So tune in for that. And now we'll go on to Wednesday. And Wednesday, of course, is the show that started it all. 
and that is Rob Gauthier hosting the Enlightenment Evolution Hour. And this is a trip to Wednesdays where every Wednesday, Wednesday, pardon me, of the month, he'll be channeling Trev, who will talk to take all callers' questions, anything that you have. Trev will be there online. He is a how do you say that? Benevolent? Benevolent? Benevolent. Okay, how about a really nice, I like that better. He's a really nice guy, Trev. <laughs> He's all, let's say, love. Benevolent, uh, yeah, I understand, but I don't like to say it too much. <laughs> so turn to tune into Trev, call in, and his perspectives you just blow you away. And I'm not kidding. That's something he just he just sums it up in this dance that just whisks you away, and you're like, oh, when you're done. So tune in on on Wednesdays, and that's the first Wednesdays. Now the third Wednesdays we'll have a special guest, so maybe some channeler, metaphysic teachers. Anything like that, someone doing some work in the Ascension world that he wants to get out there and promote them and get that awareness out to the collective is another perspective of Ascension. And then the other two uh, weeks are freestyle call-ins. So it's basically everyone getting together online, calling in and sharing experiences, any ideas, perspectives, questions, answers, and the callers end up talking amongst each other kind of idea bring in different aspects from the three or four different people at the same show, and it's really, really good, and it gets deep, and we love it. So there you go. That's on Wednesday. Again, shout out to the King for bringing this to us and allowing all of us the opportunity to express our highest joy through the medium of radio. Booyah. Now let's move on to Thursday. Yeah, yep. Oh, no. Here and we go. Here we go. Okay, I'm going to come up with it, but let me first talk about it. Philip Malika. We'll be hosting, you're, you're making me laugh, okay. Philip Malika hosting the Consciousness Evolution Hour. Yes. And we talk about, and I say we because I get to co-host on there a lot, we talk about anything about that, a wide range of metaphysical topics, perspectives of 3D to 5D, and we, where we're at, where we're going, where we've been, how it helps, anything to do with it, and it's done in the moment done in the moment. It is just by the fly, by the seat of your pants idea. And what did you call it? It is spiritual. I, I said it was spirit. If spirituality was a full contact oh, sport. <laughs> <laughs> when me and him are co-hosting, spirituality would be a full contact sport that gives you an idea of what goes on in those shows together. I'm Philip's show and then as well as my on Saturday. We just have a great, great time on there. And, um, he also has a meetup group that he does right there in Clarks, Clarksville, Clarksville, Clarkston, sorry, Phil, uh, Clarkston, Michigan. And we are having a, I'm going to shout this out on Labor Day weekend starting on Saturday. If you go to Consciousness 2.0, there's a link on there to the party of the century. We're going to call it the Ascension Ball of 2014, the end of 2014 Ascension Ball. And it's right there on the lake, and I can't pronounce the lake, Wagamagiga. <laughs> lake Wagamagiga, really. I think it is. Really. <laughs> lake Wagamagiga. Thank you, I got Molly sitting right here. She goes, Lake Wagamagiga, you nuts. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Molly. So we got a lake. We got a couple of, of huge connected yards because the neighbors, of course, want to share in this. We're going to have bands, DJs, channelers all day. I'll be there. Local channels. Rob Gothier will be there. We're trying to get Brad Adro- Brad there. Oh, but by the way, oh, I've got to shout that out. Brad Adronis is this Tuesday on Victoria Vegas' show at 9 and 6. And tune into that because Brad and Adronis are bringing the thunder. So shout out to Brad and hope you can see you at that party at Philip's house. Okay. And uh, so that's Philip. Uh, Monica once again and Consciousness 2.0 on Facebook and also the Enlightenment Evolution Hour group and page on Facebook is how you can find all of us and then Friday we'll give a shout out to Special K Kalina and that is the Earth Experience with Kalina Angel that's 9 and 6 on the West 9 East and 6 West she'll be hosting her own upcoming show which I just read that because it's an old one her now current show called the Earth Experience on Friday nights, it explores our soul's expansions through the human experiences on Earth. The first topic, which is already passed, pardon me, was when the shift hits the fan. So here's what it's about. Get on there, and she has such a production, tie-ins, music, channelers, quotes, 
that she brings her whole medley of the whole topic of that evening using several different sources to have the perspective on the overall theme of the show. In other words, it's it's really well, well, well put together. Last week was, uh, I'm sorry, not last week, the week before was masks. You know, what mask are you wearing and that kind of idea, which we all don masks in a way every day. We all identify with an individual part of us as a sustaining idea for identification. And the idea, which is kind of like what you guys were talking about, you and Phil, you know, when you take, I'm not my hand, I'm not this, I'm not that, what are you left with, you know? I am just what will remain. So when you take off your mask, what are you? You know, that kind of thing. And she did a great, great job with that. So tune in on Fridays and for the other experience, once again, with Kalina Angel. Now, Super Saturday is Foxy Roxy, that's me, with our <laughs> two-hour, I, I put this, a two-hour mind-bending ascensioning downloads. Be open, be ready, and just be with us while we answer your questions about past lives, extraterrestrial, soul purpose, energy activation, and all things ascension. So I think I'm just going to put all things ascension and shorten that up because anything you talk about, and I do mean anything, is in the awareness of humankind. It is about the ascension because that's what we're doing. We're on our journey home. So tune in. I am on at 11 a.m. on the east and 8 a.m. on the west coast. Philip co-hosted with me. You co-hosted with me yesterday. We had a great, great show. We got a lot of good comments on that show. We had great perspectives, and it's done in the now. Whatever our highest excitement is, bringing out the in the now moment of understanding, of reflection, of perspective, creating our perception, giving us experience, leading us home. It is beautiful work. So, if you're interested in that, tune in on Saturdays, and that's my show, Odyssey of Ascension. And once again, I'm. Roxanne Swainhart. Now, Sunday is, of course, the show you're listening to at this current now. Go ahead. Tell us about your show, Dolph. Well, the show is about oneness with Karen Newman. I am Karen Newman, your host. And every week we have a different guests as well as authors, channelers, teachers, healers. And then there's one uh, week a month where we will be doing readings with my twin soul, Crystal Vandenacher. Next week, I have the wonderful Francesca Cassini. She's a dear friend of mine from England. She took one year of her life. She sold everything, and she hit the road and lived as a nomad. She traveled to France and to different places in Europe. But this, her one year as a nomad culminated in a book that she is called a fictional account of her experiences called Waking the Lions. And it's really a journey of self-destruction from a woman who was completely destroyed by life and how she picked up the pieces and really found herself. So Francesca will be there talking about her book. She is also a medium, and she will be giving readings. So that's next week, the 10th of August. So please tune in and talk to Francesca. So we are done with the announcement. I'm here. Phil's there. I'd like to uh, say that we... We're going to at the. I, I do see someone on that's on the uh, switchboard with their hand up. They've been very kind and they've been signed in since the beginning of the show. So I want to uh, also put out the call-in number because I, we can continue with the conversation. But if anyone does have a question for Phil, then they can call in and, and have their question answered. But the call-in number is three four seven three zero eight eight seven eight eight. Or if you're if you want to call in via Skype, you can go to the show page of this uh, show on Blog Talk Radio, and there is a little Skype button. And if you push the Skype button, it will call you into the show. So that's another way that you can call in for free. If you want to call in with your phone, again the number is three four seven three zero eight eight seven eight eight. So welcome back, Phil. I hope you had a nice little break, and. I've been, uh, yes, I'm, I'm ready, ready to go. <laughs> You're ready to go. Well, why don't we pick up where we left off then uh, and talk about as we've moved forward in, in time, um, when, we, when we really got to meditation and the Beatles, and, and how did that really uh, yes. come about? <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you, um, yes. you know, uh, I lived through that period, and I knew that the Beatles um, 
when the Beatles connected to India, when they met their guru uh, and went to India, I knew that was huge. But when I researched the book, I realized it was even bigger than I thought it was and that I remembered it. And I ended up um, beginning the book. Well, here, I'll read it. The, the first two sentences of the book are, in February 1968, the Beatles went to India for an extended stay with their new guru, Maharshi Mahesh Yogi. It may have been the most momentous spiritual retreat since Jesus spent those 40 days in the wilderness. And when I wrote that, I thought, oh, man, I'm going to get in trouble comparing the Beatles to Jesus and all that. And and the book's been out four years now almost, and nobody's objected to that because it was true. It was huge. (laughs) It had an enormous impact. The Beatles were so famous and so popular in 1967 when they met Maharshi Mahesh Yogi and then in 68 when they went to India um, that everything they did made news and and big-time news. There was no cable TV or Internet, of course, but it was headlines in the papers and cover stories in magazines all over the world. And that was the beginning of the mainstreaming of yogic teachings and meditation in a big way. It, you know, the, the momentum had been building. There were always people in the counterculture and in the arts who were drawn to, and philosophers, who are intellectuals who were drawn to these things. But now it was ready to be a mass phenomenon. And when the Beatles discovered Transcendental Meditation, it was like overnight the whole world knew what the word mantra was, right. what the word guru was. They would soon know what an ashram was. And they knew suddenly that there was something called meditation that anybody could do and benefit from. It's not just something for hermits and caves or monks. Because here were the most famous and among the richest people in the world who could do anything, and they chose to go and sit in in an ashram on the Ganges uh, meditate. This must have meaning. This must mean something. And by the thousands, young people like me were um, drawn to take up the same practice because especially John Lennon and George Harrison were so enthusiastic about the value of meditation. Right. Um, And and outspoken about the fact that they were no longer interested in uh, drugs because this was a safer, more natural way to uh, open up the inner life and um, expand consciousness. And so millions of thousands or millions of people took up meditation practices. And that led a scientist to say, what's going on here? And to do the first studies on on meditation and when those studies were published and the results showed that there were actual measurable physiological changes, beneficial changes that came about when you meditated, that opened the floodgates and brought what seemed like an esoteric, you know, maybe something for, you know, counterculture kids into the mainstream. So within a few years time, there were, uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of studies, and um, by the mid '70s, psychotherapists and doctors were recommending it for their patients. And this this was the real beginning of uh, these practices and, and teachings entering the heart of the culture. Isn't that amazing? Just I I, I, yeah. re- I remember uh, an interview that I saw with. And I think it was the Dick Cavett show with when uh, George Harrison was on the Dick Cavett show, and he brought uh, who did he bring with him? I don't Probably remember. Probably Ravi Shankar. He brought he, exactly. He brought Ravi Shankar, and just talking about it, and they were like, "Don't you want to play?" And he was like, "No, I'm not here to play." He was there to introduce Ravi Shankar, mm. but he talked about the influence of India and and 
dealing with the Maharishi and meditation and Dick Cavett yeah. being so, you know, as stoic as he was and it's sort of kindly skeptical without being, you know, without being out and out a denier. He was truly fascinated by all of these terms that, that George was, was talking about and you just saw the quizzical look on his face like, do you really believe this stuff? And it, it was it was really yeah, and that had been going on now for quite some time, and you could see interviews with people like David Frost, and in, in print interviews and um, print uh, stories by you know major uh, reporters for outlets like Look magazines uh, and Life magazines cover stories in 1968. Um, it was all this. It was much more respectful and less cynical than I thought it would be when I went back and looked at it. It was all very curious. It was like, really, this stuff has value? Really? Are you serious? And, you know, a lot of it was parents being interviewed saying, well, you know, I was really worried about my kid dropping out of school and taking drugs, and, I, you know, and now he's into meditation, and, I, you know, I don't know what the hell's going on, and it's kind of scary, but... It's better than um, him having a drug overdose, or <laughs> yeah. you know. Now he yeah. he talks to, he and he's going back to school because his guru said go back to school. You know, it's like I couldn't get him to do it, but his guru did. You know, and it's like so it had a positive overtone to what was going on, and um, even though people didn't fully understand it or trust it. Yeah. Well, it it. It was definitely the beginning, and that that's what I was I, – I think there's something in your book, and you say – and I can't remember exactly what you said, but you talked about the first time that the Beatles introduced Maharishi, and then within two years he was on the – Maharishi himself was on the cover of Time magazine. Am, am I correct in that? Um, it, not quite. It was um... – when when he had been getting popular, uh, his meditation practice was getting popular among young people. And then when the Beatles discovered him, it was just uh, the floodgates opened. And so he was on the cover of magazines, usually in, a, in connection with the Beatles. Uh, he was on the cover of magazines in 1968. When I do presentations, um, on American Veda. Um, people want to know so much about the Beatles that I started doing presentations just about the Beatles and their whole spiritual journey and how they discovered India and then opened up India to the rest of us and the songs that came out of it and so forth. Yeah. And I do it, you know, wherever I'm invited to do it, I have a multimedia presentation. And sometimes I do it with a really great live band. Like uh, we're doing it at the Santa Fe Yoga Festival and on Labor Day weekend, um, but I, I go into all this, and I what I what you're remembering is that there were cover stories with Maharishi on them in 1968 in association with the Beatles and all the young people getting off, off of drugs to learn to meditate. Within a few years, because of the research, he was back on the cover of magazines. Only now the the emphasis was on. Uh, middle-aged people learning to meditate instead of doing Valium and antidepressants. So it had become medicalized. You know, there's a there's a recent uh, thing that I've I've come in contact with that in Princeton University now they launched in a huge huge study. And there's some doctors from Princeton that have now incorporated meditation into their doctoral practice and they've shown how bones are healing more quickly diseases being eliminated and they've actually incorporated meditation now into their practice based on all of this information and based you know the people who are the doctors are also you know studying uh eastern thought and have incorporated it now into their yeah. doctoral practice so it just shows you how how far things have come and and how much further and we have been to go. Going on now. Yeah, and, that, and that, pra that process has been going on for over 40 years now. And, of course, now the, the research and the uh, technology is so much more sophisticated. <clears throat> but now it's not at all uncommon for, you know, doctors or 
health clinics to recommend meditation and yoga to uh, alleviate stress and that sort of thing. It's very common now. Yeah. We have and a caller. research going on. Oh, I don't mean to cut okay. you off. Sorry. Go ahead. No, finish your finish your. No, it's okay. There's research. Just that there's research going on in a lot of reputable universities and institutions. Yeah, it's it's incredible. We have a caller that's been holding for quite some time, and I I would like to because we're okay. we, I think we could talk and and run out of show time. So I would like to give the person at the seven eight zero area code that's been standing on hold for some some time just just a chance to ask you any question they may have if you're okay with that. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Perfect. Here we go. Hi, seven eight zero. Are you there? Uh, yes, uh, namaste and welcome. Uh, let me welcome you to the show. Thank you very much. Oh, namaste and thank you so much for calling. You have a question for Philip Goldberg? Yeah, I just wondered. Um, I'm actually right now um, studying actually Shaanism through uh, Kalua Tantra uh, philosophy, basically. It's found it, found it really interesting. Have you found that some of the native stuff, uh, especially shamanism, comes from actually deep rooted in uh, Indian philosophy? You know, uh, it's a very good question, and you would have to find an expert on shamanism and its history. Uh, but I can I can just say that from what I can see, and I don't know um, if there's direct connection, but some of the teachings in the shamanistic traditions, and of course they're very diverse, they're shamanistic teachings from all over the world, um, including India um, and, and other parts of Asia. Um, they, in many ways, there you can find certain similarities, especially in the, in the Tantra uh, tradition, um, but I don't know if there's any direct connection. I just, you know, in the early days, um, you know, when Buddhism got to Tibet, for example, it sort of mingled with its native shamanistic teachings and evolved into what we now think of as Tibetan Buddhism. And I think some similar things happened in India when some of the yogis sort of mixed with native uh, spiritual teachings that we might think of as shamanistic and uh, sort of evolved into tantric teachings. But I'm not, I'm not really uh, sure about all that. Um, my second question is about I, I, I the, oh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I just wonder about the new direction. You're talking about the Beatles actually spreading um, the philosophy of India through the, what they were as a famous people. But I just wondered about the new, the new generation right now. The new generation I find is more scattered and everything. What do you think is going to be the next thing for them to actually do some some sort of type of uh, Meditation or something like that. You know, to, to I, focus. I, often when I give talks, I'm asked about the future, and I always joke that it was hard enough to get the past right, you know, in in writing about uh, the history of it. So I'm I'm reluctant to make any predictions. What I see with young people is that they have access to so much, and it's such easy access. I mean, when I first heard about the Bhagavad Gita, I couldn't even find a copy in New York. It was until, you know, I had to go to like 10 bookstores before I found one. And now, you know, the access to this information and the teachings, the spiritual teachings of, of the world's traditions are so easy to access. It's impossible to predict what might become uh, popular or what might become trendy. Here in the U.S., Hatha yoga, you know, the physical aspects of yoga is huge. And, right. you know, no one could have predicted that 20 years ago. And and even harder predict, to predict would have been the popularity of the uh, Indian devotional practice uh, of, of, of devotional singing or chanting called kirtan. There are festivals of uh, kirtan uh, practice with uh, a huge variety of performers that attract thousands of people. And it's it's becoming part of 
the spiritual landscape of of uh, of America now. This ancient devotional chanting mixed with Western musical instruments and rhythms and so forth. <coughs> so where it's going to go next, I have no idea. But it'll be interesting. It will be. Very interesting. Well, thanks so much for letting me be part of the show. Thank you. <laughs> well, you're welcome. I just want to say one thing. If I don't know if you've read the works of Ralph um, Waldo Emerson, but he has a wonderful essay called Nature, and he talks about that if you really want to be connected, and it also talks about this also in the, the Veda text, about just being connected with nature. And that's really sort of the premise yes. of shamanism. So whether there's a direct link, there's just there's still a link to truth. And the truth is the yes. truth. So in that way... And as I, long as we still have the raw nature, we can all access that. Yeah, so so the common the common thread and maybe one that would just sort of reinforce the other would be that link to nature and the call to to return to it and to be contacted in, in contact with it. I think Thoreau was the one who was talking about, you know, if if you can just touch nature and simplify your life, then you will know truth. And I think that's also the shamanistic ideal. Yeah, they that's come... also very good. Good points. Good point, Karen. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you so much, caller. If you have another question, I'm going to put you back on hold. Was there anything else that you had, or was that it? Oh, that's it. That's a great, great, great interview. It's been looking, I just love the show last year. I've been listening for the last two hours, so... Thank oh, you. awesome! Well, stay with us for the, we've got about twenty minutes, more minutes, and and uh, and definitely check out uh, Phil's. What is your course that you're giving again, Phil? Please. Oh, uh, the Great Yogic Transmission uh, is going to be on Holistica. dot com, and um, the information about it there and on my websites. And uh, I welcome any of your listeners to to join us for that. Okay, it's going to be a great exploration of this. Holistica is Holistica spelled, with a W. Yes, so W H O L. W H O L I S T I K A. Dot com. Yep. Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, thank you so very much. I'm going to put you back on hold, and if you have another question, just press one again, and you can and you can come back on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Let me see if I do this right. Okay. You, I'm here. I, okay, perfect. I, I read a quote uh, when you were talking about trying to find the Gita. You said, and this is a direct quote from your book, I dashed around Manhattan looking for the Bhagavad Gita, harder to find than a Red Sox fan. I found a yoga studio. <laughs> Also not easy, believe it or not. I learned transcendental meditation as the Beatles had done, but not because of them. I became a teacher of the practice for several years. My discoveries changed my life for the better. Why don't you talk about, because a lot of people may not know, what is transcendental meditation? Oh, that um, is a, <laughs> the practice. <laughs> well, that's... Um, that was that was the the name of the practice uh, that Maharshi Mahesh Yogi brought to the West, um, and was for many years the sort of um, epitome or the, def- the very definition of meditation practice as we understood it in the West. It became so popular between 1967 and and the late 70s for that decade. Uh, Maharishi was kind of the the face of uh, gurus from India, and that practice was the um, the sort of essence in people's minds of what India had to offer, and um, and it was the it was so systematically taught that um, he trained people like me to teach others, uh, and the uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people learned it in those years, and it is still possibly the most uh, best known and certainly beyond 
far and beyond, far and away, the best researched form of meditation uh, that is available to us in the West. Um, uh, partly because it, it it was so systematically taught that it, it, it was very amenable to scientific investigation, and, and the first studies uh, of meditation were done on TM, as it's abbreviated, and that's one of the reasons for the, that it became so popular, uh, in addition to the celebrity factor of people like the Beatles and now, you know, Oprah and Jerry Seinfeld and people like that advocating it, um, because the research on it was so powerfully uh, influential. And continues to be. There's still a lot of research on it. So it's kind of the uh, quintessential meditation practice. There are a lot of forms of meditation out there. And I want your listeners who uh, may be new to some of this to be aware of the fact that uh, the people lump the, all the meditation forms together, and now they lump them together with mindfulness practice. Um, in fact, these are very subtle and powerful practices, and they're not all the same. You know, different practices are uh, engaged in differently, and so the effect they have on the mind and the body, on the brain, will be different in each case. Um, and um, so I would uh, always, uh, I always advise people if they're looking for a meditation practice to, to. Uh, look into those that are well understood and well uh, practiced and, and come from a, uh, a respectable and uh, proven tradition of teaching. And, um, you know, if there's research done on them, they look into that because they're not all the same. So TM was sort of the quintessence of um, meditation practice and um, over time became the best known and the best uh, researched. But it comes from the, the Vedanta tradition of India and is, was just uh, made more systematic by Maharishi, uh, Mahesh Yogi to uh, make it easy to um, disseminate outside of India. Okay. That's a very good explanation. Explanation. Sorry, I think <clears throat> I, I think a lot of people they like you said they do they group meditation in sort of one giant lump, and there are specific practices yeah. for specific goals. And, it, it, and if you, you want to learn one, then you should definitely understand it in its entirety. Do your homework. Yes, I, I think that's yeah. important for. Well, that's a very important point, and I think that's why your book also is so incredible because there's a lot of dipping and tasting into a lot of traditions and I that's perfectly valid to take what you like but it, it there is a there is a um how do you want to say there is a value in exploring something completely and and really yes. understanding it and that's one of the things that's that one of the yeah go ahead what you were saying that's one of the one of the challenges for anybody on a spiritual path is um you know, there's a lot available, and you want to explore. And there's a, especially a phase, there are phases in one's life where exploration is what you're called to do and what's necessary. Um, but there is a risk that if you explore, um, you can essentially just become spiritually promiscuous and <laughs> and just and just sort of. You know, you just sort of dabble in a lot of different things and you don't give it the time and attention to go deeply into anything. So, you know, there's an explore. While exploration is essential, um, so is uh, finding something that when it appeals to you, uh, to go deeply into it, to, to really, you know, uh, give it a, a, a chance and experience it and experience it deeply and investigate it in a, in a more thorough way. And that sort of combination is, is necessary. People, one of the analogies people use about people who just explore is you never, if you dig a lot of holes, you never go deeply enough to get water. Yes. You know, so, but, yes. but digging holes is important to see if there's water. 
<laughs> so, so there's a combination of things you need. You know, if you're if you if you're searching for water, you dig some holes and you try and see if the, and if you find something promising, well, you go deeper and deeper, and then some you may find something that that lasts and endures. I'll use myself as, as an example. I started exploring meditation practices back in the '60s, and when I hit upon a TM, it worked for me, and I got deeply into it and became a teacher of it. And I continued all these 40-some-odd years to explore other areas and other philosophies, other ideas, other teachings. But I also keep going deeper into that one practice because that works for me. So, you know, there's the being anchored and also uh, being free enough to explore. That That is a necessary phenomenon. combination. Yeah, the anchoring yeah. is a great terminology to use. I, I do want to bring up, I, there's, I have so many things I would like to talk about, but we are coming um, unbelievably quickly to to the end of the show. Yeah. Um, but I know that Roxy is a big fan of uh, Krishnamurti, and oh. maybe, which is interesting, and I love the way that you present him in the book because you, you know, someone who didn't want to become a rock star became a rock star <laughs> anyway, yeah. and, and just he was sort of the anti-guru of of gurus. That's right. And, yeah, yeah that's right. And there's there's one little point I wanted to bring up. It's interesting because he's settled in Ojai, California, and I don't know if you know oh. this. But Ojai has produced a lot of mystics and a lot of channelers. Yes. Uh, one of them is actually a host on our radio network, Daniel Scranton. He's a channeler. He channels all kinds ah. of different entities. And there's another one named Nora Harold. And Nora also has a partner who I can't remember her name, but also from Ojai. And Ojai seems to now be a hotbed of mystics that have come out. And I... When I saw that, I just instantly had the idea that there's that's not no coincidence. But you no, know, and it doesn't shock me. And anybody, I live in L.A., so I'm like an hour, two hours from Omaha, um, and it's a beautiful place and a very has a very deep uh, feeling about it up in in the hills, um, you know, in, in these beautiful countryside and. And I, you, you're probably, I think a lot of people were drawn to Ojai uh, because of Krishnamurti, and many of them stayed, you know, and found it a great place to live. So it's one of those sort of spiritual little uh, uh, hotbeds, as you put it, uh, of which there are many in, in the U.S. And, uh, and probably in Europe as well. Um, but, yeah, it doesn't shock me at all. Krishnamurti was a fascinating guy. Yeah, can you say to tell to our audience who does may not know who he is? Well, talk about know, who he was. He, he was discovered as a teenager by uh, in um, what was what was then Madras and is now Chennai on the. Uh, Phil, did we lose him? Uh, it's still showing that he's on. Who? Oh, he uh, muted himself, possibly? Oh, yeah, maybe. Oh, there What's he is. What's happening? There you oh, there you go. go. You're oh, back. You're back. You're back. You, we, the connection oh, yeah, I heard all these strange sounds. Okay. <laughs> well, okay, we, we started you with, you, we stopped with Madras. Okay. So they're uh, on the east coast of um, of India, it's now Chennai. Uh, the Theosophists, uh, a, a spiritual movement that was be, uh, began in New England here in America in the, in the 19th century by Madame Blavatsky, who had come here from Russia um, and was influenced by Emerson and all the teachings of Hinduism and Buddhism, um, set up shop in, in Madras, and they became very influential both in the West and in India. And they discovered a young teenager who seemed to be very advanced spiritually, <clears throat> named Jiddu Krishnamurti, and they sort of anointed him as the, the, the forthcoming uh, Messiah, essentially, Savior. And, and they took him to England, 
to school him in, with a Western education and the English language. And, you know, then they launched him as this Messiah person, you know, who was this young... They called him world teacher or something, right? They, the I, world I, teacher. That's world that's teacher. Right. I he remember was, that's right. Yeah. That's right. He was going to be the world teacher. And I forget what the um, organization was called. It was kind of an offshoot of um, theosophy. Right. And, um, and you know, of the order of the star. And, yeah. um and they had, you know, it, it became very big. And then in uh, sometime in the 20s, uh, here, 1929, at they, they had their annual meeting. And there was Chris <laughs> Newberti, who by then, was, by then was 34 years old or so. Uh, and he essentially announced that uh, he really didn't want to do this Messiah thing. Right. <laughs> and not only did he, Yeah. Not only didn't he want to, but he didn't think it was a good thing. He thought this was bogus and that you don't need a Messiah and you don't need a Savior. You were all on our own on this spiritual journey and you should be self-reliant and I'm out of here. And that, <laughs> yep. it, it, no, that was it. And it blew everybody's mind. And he, you know, then would divide his time between uh, India and Ojai and um, became essentially a philosopher, uh, you know. And and as time went on, became and and wrote these incredible books, these brilliant books. Uh, um, but refused to be part of a religion or a tradition or any of that, um, and just wanted people to be self-reliant. But we can be self-reliant to a point we all need teachers and we need guides. And he became that for so many people, even while he was telling them they don't need teachers. And right. so it was this irony. And then when uh, Maharshi Mahesh Yogi and all the other gurus became so popular in the late 60s and 70s, he was denouncing them. He was saying, you don't need gurus, and you don't need religion, you don't need any of these traditions, you don't need these teachings. Just, you know, look into yourself. And he had these, uh, you know, methods of self-inquiry and so forth. And and he would tell people, you know, just silence your mind and discover the, you know, the infinite nature of your consciousness. And people would say, well, yeah, that sounds good, but I can't do it, so I think I'll go to learn PM or, you know, and and then come back to Krishnamurti and get to his philosophy. And so it was this crazy irony going on of the more he denounced gurus, the more he people treated him like a guru. Exactly. <laughs> and it, was, it was very, very strange. But his teachings live on. I mean, he's been gone now for uh, 30 years or so. And, but his books and the videos and the recordings live on. And the, the Krishnamurti Foundation in, in Ojai is very active in promulgating his work. And, um, you know, when I, I, there's a funny story. When I first was researching the book, I contacted all the different spiritual organizations that had connections to the gurus who came here and the, and the teachings uh, that came from India. And... I, I called the Ojai people and I said, I want to come up and visit and do some research on Krishnamurti. And they said, Oh, well, why do you want to do that? He wasn't a guru. <laughs> and, I said, and he wouldn't want, he wouldn't want to be in a book with all these other gurus. And I said, Oh, well, how about if I put it this way? I'm, I want, I'm doing research on teachers who came here from India. Oh, okay. Right. As long as you know, it was like you didn't want to, the word guru was out of the question, you know, right. and the word spiritual teacher out of the question, but philosophers, you know, I, that sort of thing was okay. And, <laughs> but he, he fits, you know, he's in there as the sort of anti-guru guru, but he had a huge impact and still does to this day. But when you look at his teachings, it's pure Vedanta. It's his oh, own life, so. his own, but it's, it's the essence of Vedanta. And there's no denying that. That's that's, and let's 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 broaden that a bit because one of the things that may be useful for uh, 
your listeners is to recognize that Vedanta and Indian philosophy and these teachings, they're not, we think of them in the category, like we think of Hinduism and Buddhism as one of the religions of the world. And in the West, we think that must mean it's a belief system and it has doctrines and dogmas and, you know, that's the category we put them in. But really, when you think of it, Vedanta and yoga, which are sort of the aspects of Hinduism that came to the West, they are not religions in the usual way. They're more like um, a science of consciousness. They're ideas and insights that can be understood and as sort of hypotheses about who we are and the nature of reality and the methodologies like meditation and yoga and self-inquiry, these are practices that you can sort of analogize to laboratory work. And so they're not, um, they're, they're sort of universal teachings that could be applied in a spiritual context or a secular context. Science can investigate them. You can understand them religiously or spiritually because they're like, you know, physics or biology, you know, they're, they're universal t- uh, ideas and practices and insights. And that has, those are, show up, the essence of Vedanta shows up in other cultures too. It shows up in mystical Christianity, in mystical Judaism, in Sufism, in Buddhism, and these core ideas are universal and they've been discovered by different people in different cultures. And that insight of the universality has come to be called perennialism or perennial philosophy. And that's why they show up in all these cultures and and, in different forms and in different languages. Yes. And for Hinduism, Hinduism is usually referred to by people who are Hindu as uh, Sanatana Dharma, which is the eternal law or the eternal way. And And how you get to that and and how you follow it, that is completely up to you. But the the quote-unquote eternal part of it being the ultimate truth, the ultimate way, not that there's a religion associated, but it's finding that truth that's associated with it. Right, and if you take any spiritual tradition deep to its essence, you come to the uh, aspect of it that the mystics uh, explored. Um, as opposed to the theologians and the the dogmatic preachers and so forth. But where the mystical experience, the inner experience is concerned, that's uh, what Houston Smith, who wrote the foreword to American Veda, uh, calls the the esoteric aspect of religion, as opposed to the exoteric, the external aspects of religion, the inner aspect of, of spiritual teachings, bring you to an inner experience of what you would say is about oneness. Right. <laughs> and, and, that, yeah. and that is eternal. That's perennial. And you can get to that through many different pathways. Hmm. Well, we're running out of time. We have about a minute and a half left. So I want to, uh, I want to just uh, sum everything up. I, I wish we had gotten to talk about Houston because he, his four was beautiful. His works are beautiful. He has, you know, that's a whole another section. That's a whole another conversation. But yeah. just a quick, uh, quick little thing. Uh, when uh, when Krishna uh, Murti ended his, when he dismantled the organization, he was in the Netherlands when he did that. Is that right? Yes. Oh, great. Yes, he was in, yeah. yeah, he was in the Netherlands, so that's my uh, connection to him. All right. But most sincere thank you uh, for coming on the show, sharing your information about your book. I want to just give your websites one more time and, to again, give the dates of your upcoming lecture and anything else that's coming up for you. So go go right ahead, please. Okay, I'm philipgoldberg.com and americanvega.com. The online uh, course uh, called the, the Great Yogic Transmission will, will be launched in mid-September on holistica.com. That's W-H-O-L-I-S-T-I-K-A.com. And um, one can listen to that at, at their convenience. 
Um, and um, if you go to my website uh, or write me an email, I'll put you on my mailing list. I give lectures and uh, presentations about American Veda, yoga, and um, so forth. Uh, and um, all that's on the website. Okay, we're about to go off air, so thank you, Philip Goldberg. Thank you, Roxanne. Thank you, everyone, for listening. You can visit me at aboutoneness.com, and we'll see you next week. So thank you very much. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. I'm just going to...